All right. right. So this is how we're going to start. You're going to say who you are, the name of your company. Okay. I'm Tomas Hernandez. I'm the co-founder of, uh, Soul, of Soul Repo, Sober Living. Um, I'm Tomas Hernandez. I'm the co-founder of the Bobby Hornbuckle. Uh, let me redo that. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead and just introduce yourself. Just, you're talking to Bryce the entire time. Don't even okay. know what's saying. These cameras are here. Okay. Well, I'm Tomas Hernandez. I'm the co-founder of the Hornbuckle Foundation with uh, Michael Hornbuckle. He's a uh, contemporary blues musician. We got uh, some history together, um, some sober time, and we came up with a good idea to come up with uh, Soul Repo Sober Living that you're sitting in right now. It's uh, got a little twist to it. Um, took a little bit of Mike, took a little bit of me, and decided to give a shot at it our way, so to speak, and work with all the great sober livings and treatment centers that are in Colorado or in the nation. We're just like uh, Mile High Sober Living, man. We'll take them wherever they're at. You know, <laughs> fly them in, put them in a bed, see if they can get some recovery. So uh, let's say, let's pretend I'm like a guy, I'm calling you, and I'm, let's say I'm not in treatment. Well, do most of you guys come from treatment, or do they come from, like, court? Uh, we got about half court right now. Okay, so let's say court I call voucher. court. What do I got to do to get in there? Court voucher, usually the probation or the parole officer is going to call me. They're going to do an assessment. They're going to walk around and, and uh, check the place out. Um, most have already done that, so that kind of that area is done. But uh, I'm going to talk to the kid, see what he's about, see if he's just not trying to get out of jail. What do you want to see? I want to see some heart, some intent, some uh, wanting to go to work, um, wanting to be coachable, you know. Learn some integrity. I know that a guy can come in here and just be a whip, you know. It'd be, that'd be great. Just take all TC guys that have done two-year programs and just put them in, put them in a sober living. But you know that's just not the case, and that's not what America needs. We need to be able to uh, be the big brothers to the kids that can't make it on their own. You know, so that's what we do, man. I just, I just got to find. I just got to take their heartbeat. You know, it's just like any other director. Have that conversation of, of recovery, or see if they're willing to fake it to make it. To get through probation, because sometimes that and parole, that'll get somebody to the next level. If uh, you know they're going to be serious about probation, they're uh, a little bit about recovery. I got something I can work with, you know. But if they're not serious about probation or recovery, it's like, hey man, this is it's not going to be a fit, you know. And then the other guys that we get here, they come from everywhere. You never know, especially the ones that just fly in. You know, you could have they could be like, oh yeah, we're. I love recovery, dude. This is, you know, I just relapsed about seven times in one week. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, 12 steps is awesome. 12 steps is awesome. Then they get here and they're like, you know, screw it all. I'm going to sleep until noon. And then you got to deal with the process. So it's not, you know, as you as an owner, no, it's not perfection. It's uh, just being available and being able to work the, the situation. Because sometimes what's great about our community we have is if it's not a fit here, like how me and you bounce off with each other and Sobriety First and Carla Vista and Kevin Chavez's place, all that stuff, there's somewhere that this kid could thrive. He may not do good here, but he, he might just do good over at Mile High. Mm -hmm. He might just do good at Sobriety First, you know? So I like this, um, but I know what you do. So I want you to say, like, I, we're not, you're not getting uh -huh. your hearted souls who went to college uh -huh. and smoked pot and still call their mama bitch. You're getting guys that this is it for them, right? They got nowhere yeah. else to go, and you're willing to take them in if they're mm. willing to recover. So tell us that. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. the guys you're getting, I want to hear about this. So, you're 37 years old, I walked into my dad's uh, front door. This man, you're talking about a man that's uh, worked the fields of Colorado, one of 14 kids. You know, they didn't have a lot of stuff for 14 kids. What can you do? Borrow each other's shirts. You know what I mean? Uh, tough, tough, tough man. Hard, hard hands. Hands of stone. Uh, hard worker. Mechanical engineer. 70-something um, years old. I've never seen a tear until that day. And he goes, this is the legacy that you're going to leave me. He goes, a washed up junkie, violent, ex-con, drunken punk. He goes, I don't even want to look at you right now. Go upstairs. So that's always stuck with me. You know, how, how, do I, how do I change my own lineage of being that at 37 years old? 
Who can I just ask to help me to do that? You know, besides bend knee and pray to God. And that never worked before either because it was always a foxhole prayer. I didn't even know how to pray. I didn't even know how to meditate. You know, just somehow that prayer got answered. And what I do today is I don't want parents to feel like that anymore because I take these kids and it's their last chance, man. Or these grown men like my house manners. Sydney, that's my brother. He's going to be with me forever. You know, we got to make family where, where we can't have a family no more. You know, um, people get tired, repetitively going to prison, going to county jail, stealing from their loved ones, all these, all these things. And, you know, and it's not, and it's crazy that the society would be like, that's a bad person. Why would you help that? He's a bad person. He's already displayed it. It's in his action. They don't realize how much of an insidious disease this is, what it will make you do, what that bottle and that bag will make you do, <sighs> you know, um, and my heart's in this. I don't wake up and punch a clock. I sleep in it, I eat in it, I breathe in it. I'm happy in it, I cry in it, I'm angry in it. You know, um, I, don't think, uh, I don't think I changed my life, man. I like what I do. I'm just on the other side of things, man. I'm still a stone cold junkie, smart mouth or whatever i don't know if i can cuss on this one but uh yeah i'm gonna I'm watch it i'm gonna act like i'm in i'm in sunday school but anyway um yeah i don't know uh it's nice to be able to be in a position to help somebody instead of hinder somebody for once all right so here i am i'm, one, I'm a guy coming in and i'm tough but you know it's fear uh -huh. so tell me the process of me and i'm acting like a jerk uh -huh. you know i'm scared yeah. right because you yeah. You know what's going on. So how do I change? Do I start to have laughs? Do I start to connect with other people? Is it 12-step meetings? Is it Colorado? You know what I mean? Like, talk about the process. You got a guy that comes in all, all ego-driven and stoic and everything like that. I don't know if you're a football fan. I'm a big football fan. I used to always like to watch these quarterbacks and, and find out stories on how they'd calm down their team, get the anger out, get them to focus. Like, remember there's a, a thing about Steve Young. He, do you remember that uh, that movie City Slickers? Every time before he'd go out there to calm himself, before he'd go in all this rageful area, he'd watch City Slickers and he'd talk about that one thing. It's so cheesy, you know what I mean? But that's that's the Super Bowl champions, like you know, getting himself into game time. You know, us as as addicts and alcoholics, you know, prayer. That's what I use. But also at the same time, you got to be able to be kind of like that that quarterback, that coach when they come in. Joe Montana. Jerry Rice talks about one time when he was sitting there and they're about they're about to try to win the game, Super Bowl against the Cowboys. And he makes everybody look over the bench. He goes, "Hey, is that John Candy?" Just makes a joke, you know what I mean? Calms everybody down. That's what you got to do. When this guy comes in, his, his guns are blazing. He's got ego. You know he's scared. Just joke around with him a little bit, man. Be like, "Hey, man, you want some coffee?" We'll send a drink. We'll talk about all that other stuff later. You know what I mean? And then when you find that pocket to get in to, you know, score that touchdown, then you can sit there and talk to this man about when he's comfortable to talk to you. I'm not going to meet him at the door because I remember that back in the streets. You meet him at the line, they're going to be, we're both going to be fighting. No, I'm bigger. No, I'm better. No, I'm bigger. No, I'm better. You know what I mean? Just kind of sit down. Um, you know, Michael, your house manager, our great friend, he's great at that, man. He'll just... I just sit down with you until you're ready to you're ready to be real. I just stare at you until you're ready to talk, you know. If that if that could be an, my answer, you know, um just picking your slot. Just being humble. Praying to God. It's just like an intervention. Pray to God, you don't know what you're gonna say. You don't know what you're gonna run into. You don't even know if they're gonna have clothes on. <laughs> and sometimes they don't. <laughs> you gotta go in with a blanket. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh but yeah. You okay? Is your shoulder okay? I'm fine. Okay, I want to talk about, I mean, you love Colorado. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a strong, we do have a strong recovery community here. Uh, not everybody, but most people are like, it's not like a, it's a super supportive community. Right? Mm -hmm. We're not coming from a place of lack. We can all help each other, right? Um, mm -hmm. Michael, when you guys do this, and he works for me. Mm -hmm. I, I throw you guys all the time. So talk about the supportive recovery community. 
Colorado. Okay. Do you have something to say about it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I've worked all around the country. Um, just getting excited to work for somebody and not knowing if they're ethical or not. Not knowing if they're really about things. And I've worked for some people that I thought were but weren't. You know, they had good intentions, but it's just a... I'm, I feel that I've been fortunate to learn in Colorado from a community of people that care about ethics. Um, not always is perfection. I'm not trying to give us a crown. But I know, I think that we work together very well. There's a lot of beautiful treatment centers out here that do a great job. Great job, you know. Um, and if you're talking the right language, you're talking honesty, you're talking recovery, they're going to work with you. They're going to give you a shot until you shoot yourself in the foot. You know, it's like any company that's came from here. You know, uh, community recovery, a couple others. They'll move in and they'll try their jive stuff and it, they're out. <laughs> that guy's in jail, you know. I mean, the last place, I was laughing when he was coming. It was, the last place he should have went is Colorado. Mm. I mean, this is a, it's a conservative police state you know what i mean you don't you don't do that here but with that i don't know um i've worked at a lot of good places i've worked at nonprofits. um i've worked at high-end treatment centers like raleigh house of hope it's got good good services there work with a lot of people from cedar good services you know list goes on aspen ridge red rocks um you know um Shadow Mountain. I've done a lot of transports, and they got a big outfit, and it's not just Colorado. They got some good stuff going on. Uh, Fifty-two eighty. He's got some real cool stuff happening. You, you came in that same game, bringing that kind of that Minnesota feel to Colorado. That's 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 got some good stuff there, man. I mean, you know, you never know. You know, what is it? Saint something, wherever you guys are at in Minnesota. Saint Paul. Saint Paul. It's like the it's mecca. Like passion. Yeah. Love, unity, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's all for approach yeah i like it you know and and what that's what's great about colorado you can have every aspect see i'm a tc guy um i came from therapeutic communities i didn't finish stout street but christopher conway still my mentor to this day he's like my sober dad and i came from the tc atmosphere i did prison tcs it's just i needed that baseball bat over my head to pay attention you know but not everybody needs that you bring out that baseball bat you're gonna chase them away from recovery for the rest of their lives and colorado seems to have a a great choice you know if you don't have no money you got medicaid you know you got you know some of those things is unfortunate we don't have enough but we have them you know um and if you can pay obviously i mean it's just america you can go anywhere you want but still you're paying for quality treatment. If, if you have the money to go to Cedar, you have the money to go to Raleigh House, the Foundry, um, take the opportunity. It's money well spent, you know, and, and these guys that come into sober living from those places usually thrive because they came, they came from a good set foundation of recovery. I truly believe that. Yeah. Or, or, they, or they, if they really want help, yeah. There's help. I mean, there is you help. You can get sober in AA for a dollar a day. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you got to think about that. I mean, what is recovery to you? What can you afford? Um, you know, you got some kids that are around there and they're, they've are they already peeled their parents for almost a hundred grand in eight months. Man, I, I was talking to a buddy about mine that the other day because I'm a free program guy. If I peeled my mom for 25 grand, I'd just have five years sober just off guilt alone. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> the woman would make me know that I just spent her $25,000 for the rest of my life. You know what I mean? Um, but, you know, my mom's loving it. It's just a joke on that. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, um, you got to figure out what, what, you, what you can do. Because, I mean, you can find recovery. AA's, you know, 12 Steps is the perfect perfect example of it there's people that have not even walked into a detox before and they got great lives right now they put a dollar in that basket and follow those those steps and traditions you know um I, my home group's crazy you'll see me post every now and then it'd be like 16 guys of like over 250 years 
stuff that comes out of their mouths, man, is like, you know, it's, you know there's God there. I don't know how this guy knew I was feeling this way, but he just said something that gave me an oh yeah moment. And that oh yeah moment stopped me from either relapsing in behavior or relapsing the actual relapse. That's crazy how that happens, you know? It's just like, if I didn't go here today, if I didn't make this one hour, I might not be here with a good friend of mine talking on a camera, you know? That camera could have been my chalk line or my news feed for the crime that I committed or whatever, you know? Um, and that's what's great about recovery. It's, we still need it. It's a disease. You know, there's, there's a lot of people that's, I was, I was arguing with this guy the other day and he was like, man, it's not a disease. He goes, it's a choice. I go, I know it's a choice, man. I mean, it was a choice for the people that have cancer to smoke those cigarettes. You know, it was a choice for people to use dirty needles that have different diseases for that. But it's still a disease, man. And I go, you gotta think about it. Have you ever seen somebody come out of relapse or a remission of, of cancer you know, smoke one cigarette and hurt themselves and hurt others. Burn their house down and get a life sentence or kill themselves. You know what I mean? This is dangerous stuff we're dealing with here. In a matter of seconds. You know? And that's, and that's a good percentage when a relapse happens. You know? That would be a very angry cancer patient to smoke that one cigarette and just <laughs> defuse the whole neighborhood like we're capable of doing. Jumping in a car, wrecking into five neighbors yards and you know doing something even worse you know or just taking that one last shot you know i, I mean it's crazy because people just do drugs nowadays to do drugs i remember when i was younger i'd watch all these hustlers and they'd talk about they talk about man i ain't selling to that bubble gum sob right there man he don't know how to do dope and i, I always wondered what that meant they're talking about a person that just does drugs to do drugs. Say that line one more time. A person that just does drugs to do just drugs. Just to do drugs. Just to do drugs, man. He just does drugs. He has no idea on how to do it. He has no idea on what he's doing. He just goes out there and he's homeless. Stop real quick. Go ahead. It's, it's all good. Just re-pick up. Well, he goes, he goes out there and he just does drugs just to do drugs. You know, he doesn't know how to do it. He doesn't know how to make money off of it. He just knows how to wreck himself and put himself in a spiral, make the block hot, o overdose, um, all kinds of different stuff that hustlers don't like, you know what I mean? And I'm not saying that's a good thing, but you know what I mean? That's why everybody's calling, I think in my mind is calling an ec epidemic more because when it was in the ghettos, for years and years and years, there were certain codes about certain things and certain people didn't do certain drugs. You know, it's just like NFL, I work with NFL players. They'll be like, man, I ain't doing cocaine, man. I know what that did to my family, this and that, but they're gonna do Adderall. You know what I mean? They're gonna change it kind of up or whatever that, what, what's, what's for that, that certain neighborhood, you know? But you got these kids watching all this stuff and that's the things that we have in these, these houses, these identities. They come in, they see, they hear stuff on TV, they hear stuff on rap shows, they see stuff, they went to prison a couple times, you know what I mean? All of a sudden, Caleb has got lightning bolts on him and, and, and a tattooed head and face, you know what I mean? He's from Highlands Ranch, you know, um, and now he knows about things, you know, and it's all from spiraling from drugs. And if you, he never did that drug, you know, he wouldn't even be that guy because he's just trying to fit in somewhere, man. Trying to fit in somewhere. It's not even, you know, my friends that have come from ghettos, they don't want to be in the ghetto, man. They want out. They want out. I didn't come from a poor, poor house. My parents worked their butt off. I have a lot of family members that did come from poor houses. My problem was is I came from a very drug-induced family that had a lot of drugs and crime in it. There were very good people in there. My parents are good people. And I'm fortunate enough to kind of see both of those sides. You know what I mean? It's, 
That's why I work with the parent to try to help them make heads or tails of what Caleb's doing. You know? That guy don't need those lightning bolts and trying to act like he's racist. He just wants to fit in, man. He wants to be tough. He don't want to get beat up. You know? Drop the charade, man. That's what I had to do. I got all these tattoos on me. Just call me whatever you want. I ain't gonna fight you. I ain't gonna fight you, man. I don't have time for that anymore, man. I realized that all my anger and emotion and intent was fear. I'm gonna get you before you get me. I'm gonna out hustle you before you out hustle me. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna sleep with this, this girl because I know that you're my girlfriend. You're gonna sleep with this dude. All my insecurities and all that kind of stuff. And that's what's great about recovery is we learn that stuff. We learn who we are. I don't have to be that guy. I date a girl. I don't have to go in her phone. I don't have to direct her around to do. I got enough to do for myself. So I got a sponsor and it's proven I can't, you know, I can't manage this other person. You know what I mean? I got to learn how to manage my own life and all that stuff. And when you have sponsees, it's a two-way street, you know, and that's what we do professionally. When I'm working with like Sydney, my house manager or whoever, it's like, yeah, we're doing this together, brother. And he'll say some stuff and it'll change my, my perspective, you know? It's a wee program. I don't know, I kind of went off on a tangent there, but. You're intense, dude, it's good. Five minutes. Okay. What do you want to talk about? Hmm, give me a topic. You've covered a lot of good ground. With yeah. <sighs> Is there anything else you're missing from the actual, uh, what do the people do at the sober houses? What, what's the daily routine? Um... Talk about what we do here? Yeah. Okay, what we do here, um, I got a kind of a, a life skills twist to it. What I learned from Christopher Conway is I had to be ahead of the game in scheduling. Now, I don't want a TC program. I don't, never, never would want one. I don't believe in a negative reinforcement much anymore. I did at the beginning because it helped help me, but also I had to do some steps around it, you know, because it was it was giving me a giving me a pretty poor outlook on things. So what we do here is we just identify the behavior and shows and and try to find solution. And if they're writing a my sponsor says from head to heart to hand. I've met myself on the tip of a pen and found God more than I ever had on a cheap one dollar notebook from the dollar store. I did those 12 steps, man. And that's what I needed. But it was hard to do that homework on myself. It was tough. You know, we get we look in the 12 steps. Me and you are in 12 step rooms. How many people actually do it? They actually do the step work. You know, they're really into it. You know, so what I've kind of implemented here in this program, what I have is when they do their behaviors, they do a solution paper. Stop looking for answers, man. We're junkies and drunks. We can find an answer for anything. Man, my answer could be in that car, in that woman, in that that food, that that watch, you know? Um, that dope, that, that bottle. You know, let's, let's figure out a solution, a proactive, positive solution. So we gauge our solutions in this house. We also do scheduling. You know, I want my guys to be taken seriously and take themselves seriously. So when they go out, they're not just running out in the middle of the street and they're like, they had all these ideas, they didn't write them down, and they're like, I'm downtown or Civic Center Park. I got four applications. And I don't even know how some of them, it's funny how they came back with paper applications today. You know what I mean? But, a drug addict will find paper applications to bring you to show you, and it's, and it's all surface work. I want them to plan their day. Remember to eat. Remember to pray. Remember what they're doing. Decompress. Do like a 10th step at the end of the day. You know, chores, hygiene, having pride in themselves, having enough time to schedule in family, having enough time to schedule in rest. I know me and you don't know what that means, but... You know, that's kind of a do I say, <laughs> not what I do situation right there. <laughs> but you know what I mean? With that being said, um, yeah, we just want them to get, I want them in this sober living setting to also within six months 
with, with the first six months, work on things like following higher power, being God-fearing, integrity, being loving, coachable. You know, all the stuff that I have up there. Humility, gratitude, um, hardworking, um, courage. You got to find the courage every day to go out there, man. It's embarrassing to have your tail between your legs and be whatever, however old you are and then try to find a start, start something new. You know, especially being a cocky, drunk, drug addict, all of a sudden you got to get some humility and ask somebody how to do something. You know, I want them to concentrate on that. But within a year, also be self-sustaining. I remember the first thing my, my sponsor told me and my, also my mentor, Christopher Conway, told me, you got to be a man that's working in recovery. You got to be able to take care of your own bills. You know, if you're, no offense to Jamba Juice or Taco Bell or whatever, they they pay bills for some people and they some people got to live there basically to pay rent. And it's part of Americana. It's part of what, you know, the rates that we have here. But get inspired to do something with your life. A year from now, if you're working at this fast food restaurant and you want to put a needle back in your arm because you really never did any step work, you never really looked inside, you never really thought about your future and all that kind of stuff. And the family's wondering if the money was really spent right. And you're wondering, and are you really still even an addict? You know what I mean? All these ideas, and then you're back out. I want them to think about their futures here in, at Soul Repo Sober Living. I want them to think about Hornbuckle Buckle Foundation wants to pride ourselves on life skills, community. 30 seconds, guys, let's wrap it up. Uh, what do you want to see from uh, addicts from here in the future? Guys from this house that are successful, uh, what do you hope for them? What do you, what do you um, something like that. we got 30 seconds. I just hope for inner peace, man. I hope that they have a program in recovery. I hope they have some money in their pocket that they know what they're doing and doing with it. Um, they're rebuilding their relationships, whatever that may be. They found some family, they found some support, and they appreciated the time that we spent together, you know, working on recovery, working on their lives. That's, you know, it's not about the dollar amount, man. So we went nonprofit. It's all about, it's all about recovery.